through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Drop it back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows it frastic. I get drastic, hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin, episode 201. I'm Spencer. I'm Greg. Today, in honor of the release of The Man with the Iron Fist, we're going to be talking about Russell Crowe, uh -huh. uh, kind of a prolific actor. Uh, there's obviously a lot of stuff of his we could talk about. For instance, L.A. Confidential. Yes. Not going to be talking about that. If you want to hear what we thought about that, go back and watch our Guy Pierce episode mm -hmm. where we go... Same with American Gangster. I'm not going to touch that. You probably yeah. There's there's so many there's so many that we could Ridley talk about Scott episode and see how seriously, we felt yeah. about that one. We seriously could talk about uh, any number of them. Yeah. So uh, if you if you want to share what your favorite is, do it in the comments. Please do. But it's funny because uh, Russell Crowe has got to be one of the most prolific actors of the early 2000s. I mean, he's kind of tapered off a little bit since mm -hmm. then, but yeah. in the early 2000s, man, he was the Tom Hanks of the early 90s. Yes. He was that kind of prolific. He was nominated for tons and tons of awards. He's also kind of like took, I think he took uh, what I would say was Mel Gibson's old role of be playing the heroic badass as Mel Gibson mm. kind of got older and a little bit crazier. I think Russell Crowe kind of stepped up into that like sure. titular epic hero in sure. a lot of his roles. He definitely like filled that sort of action hero void mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Let's get started though. One that you had suggested, which mm -hmm. I thought was a good place to begin, Romper Stomper, yes. 1992. Yes. Uh, what can you say about this film? It's a story <laughs> about uh, a group of neo Nazis. Yes, in who, Australia who are terrorizing Vietnamese. Yes. Yes. Which kind of, you know, I was thinking about this. In some ways, it's sort of, it's not a direct comparison, but kind of reminded me of Thank You for Smoking in the sense that it's a story about a guy who you're instantly. Mm. Not going to be on board with. Like I see. it's it starts out at a deficit, I would okay. say. So yeah. it, it sort of has to earn that. you. And it, you know, it it has that challenge of like films with unlikable characters are really hard to get into. Yeah. You really have to you really have to be a persuasive in that film. It makes me think of things like Aft Pupil in American History X, where it's like mm -hmm. when you're supporting yeah, a neo Nazi X would be great, or yeah. a you know white supremacist, it's kind of hard to <laughs> position totally, yourself totally. <laughs> where you're supposed to lie in the film. But nevertheless, I mean the film has definitely received a lot of critical acclaim. Yes. I mean, have you seen it? Yes. Yeah. And what do you think about it? It is brutal. It is a brutal film that I saw. I I want to say probably early 2000s, probably post-Gladiator. Yeah, that's probably, I, I mean, I definitely saw it on video. I definitely didn't see it when it came out. No, yeah, sure. no. I saw it, like like I said, probably post-Gladiator. Um, and I just, it, you know, I knew it was one of his first roles. It was early, like, Australian Russell Crowe rather than brought to American totally. Russell Crowe. And it's just really, really brutal. It's really hard to watch uh, groups of violent people who justify their actions who don't really get their comeuppance yeah like, just, no totally totally like, i agree gang with you. type violence is just hard to watch when you're not i mean even from the victor's point of view vic, uh, victim's point of view but when you're totally no in i the agree role with of you. victor it's, oh, it's no it, it definitely does leave an uneasy feeling in yes. you for sure i i mean as you said it is australian wrestle mm -hmm. and because of that it, it was nominated for like a slew of australian yes. film institute awards and he won best actor um Film got nominated for Best Film and Best Director, but it lost. The interesting point that I want to note, hmm. though, is it won. He, or sorry, I should say, Russell Crowe won mm -hmm. Best Actor at SIF. That wow. Year. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I, I'm not at all surprised because he does an incredibly good job. Yeah. Like, I, I don't mean to merit something that comes later, but very similar to American History X in the sense mm -hmm. of um, Edward Norton is yeah. so viciously brutal. But this is much less of a sympathetic yeah a redemptive story yeah because yeah. american history x has that kind of redemptive quality this mm -hmm. this is just someone who there's no questioning they're a hundred percent in it the how they feel they're you ooh. might want to check out uh animal kingdom recent film about sort of like uh, a family of not neo-nazis but a family of criminals interesting and sort of this like weird sort of relationships between all of them and sort of like what happens when hmm. one of them is accused of murder, all sorts of stuff. And it's it's really creepy and unnerving. Hmm. And it's definitely not a direct applicable sort of hmm. film, but just, it's another sort of Australian hmm. film with that vibe that just really yes. sets an uneasy tone throughout the whole um, film. I think his name, yeah, Daniel Pollock, yeah, yeah. who played Davey. Uh, weird, weird thing I found out about the movie. I, I assume this is probably not 
related to the content of the movie, but I wouldn't be surprised if the movie had something to do with it. He was romantically involved with Jacqueline McKenzie, who was the uh, lady in the film as well, mm -hmm. and he was also an ex-heroin addict. Mm -hmm. And as soon as the movie was done filming, he threw himself under a train and killed himself. Wow. It's a shame he got nominated for Best yeah. Supporting Role. Yeah. Best mm -hmm. And them. spoiler, he's the one who lives, so... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just... Oof, that's tough. Yeah, yeah. Moving to the land of America, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. we're going to talk about one that we probably talked about on a few occasions. We but brought I'm up such, such a such a fan of it. Same here. The Quick and the Dead. Yes. This is the Sam Raimi Western mm -hmm. about a female gunslinger mm -hmm. who goes to a small town to compete in a tournament of um, gunslingers. Well, it's like quick draw. <laughs> yeah, it's a quick, quick draw that's tournament. Right. Yes, that's the proper term. Um, run by a tyrant, Gene Hackman. Ah, Gene Hackman. What a, I, I mean, what an amazing movie. The, I love the concept. The cast is phenomenal. I mean, yes. you got Gene Hackman as the main villain. You have Russell Crowe as sort of a hero. Yeah, playing priest. Uh, playing priest. Mm -hmm. You have uh, Leonardo DiCaprio as mm -hmm. Hackman's son. Or yeah, sorry, the yeah, kid. Hackman's son. Yeah. You got people like Tobin Bell. Mm -hmm. That's Pre right. Saw. Yeah. You got uh, Keith David, Lance Henriksen as also sort of like gunslingers. And this. It's a great it's movie. Crazy to think it's Sam Raimi film. Mm -hmm. He's such a versatile guy, though. I know. Really, if you think about how much diversity there's been in his career, it really kind of makes sense in that regard. But you also got to think about, like, in terms of the context of everyone else involved with yes. it, which is one of the one things I want to bring up, was, uh, for instance, the cinematographer it is Dante Spinotti. Okay. Who had done, you know, Heat. He did LA Confidential. Oh, wow. He did okay. Last of the Mohicans. He did wow. Public Enemies. He's worked with Michael Mann a lot. Um, that so, is a good guy to have around. Yeah, seriously. So, you know, definitely <laughs> Especially with a Western. If you don't have a good cinematographer on a Western, don't. why don't you even try? Also, uh, you know, the, the music in Western is obviously mm, yeah. important. And you have Alan Silvestri as the okay. composer who did Back to the Future. He did Very Predator, cool. Who Framed Roger Rabbit, <sighs> Forrest Gump. So, like... This is a super talented group of yes. actors, a super talented gr crew of filmmakers, and a kind of fun idea. In, yeah, very fun idea. And granted, opinion. you know, it's not perfect. I think it, it's sort of a forgotten... Yeah. I hate to say forgotten masterpiece, because masterpiece is probably too strong of a declaration, but it's a really fun film, it I is. think. It's and, really enjoyable, and I think the problem people maybe have is that there's not as much a single plot line that they can hold on to. You kind of have a few different people who you want to win, who you're going mm -hmm. along with. And I think maybe sure. that people who wanted to think, oh, Shannon, uh, Sharon Stone's who I'm supposed to ally yeah, with. Sharon oh, Stone. Leonardo DiCaprio's who I'm supposed to ally with. Oh, Russell Crowe's who I'm supposed to ally with. Like, I think maybe some of that, Perhaps. which is totally up Sam Raimi's alley of making things questionable, but I think that might have been where people got lost. Maybe it was just the fact that at 95 or 94 four when it, 95. 95 when it was made, uh, maybe Westerns just weren't doing good at that time. I try to I forget Oh, no, when you're Wild totally Wild right. They're, def they're definitely declining in the 90s yeah. for sure and you know i i think also you got to give a shout out to having a female lead yeah. female gunslinger which yeah. i thought was pretty cool i mean this has got to be amongst sharon stone's most enjoyable oh, yeah. work oh, for me. oh like, i agree totally i think so. it's interesting also that sharon stone seemed to have a lot of the final decisions and casts really? she was given a list of directors that uh to choice uh, that she wow. could pick, and she chose Sam Raimi without even looking at it. Wow. And she personally was the one who s chose Russell Crowe for his spot, even though this was his first American film. He was a relative unknown, yeah. and it was kind of a uneasy thing in the casting. Finally, because I love Sam Raimi, I gotta bring this up. This is, uh, for obvious reasons, this is the only film of his to date at the time that this factoid was written, which is 2002. Uh, where his trademark, trademark beige 1973 Oldsmobile Delta 88 doesn't appear in its original form. However, <laughs> according to Bruce Campbell, who you know, clearly wouldn't lie, uh, the car makes an appearance in a form of a wagon's chassis. He claims that the car was disassembled and that the chassis wow. was used for a wagon, which, while it seems silly, doesn't seem out of line for something no, Sam Raimi that's would do. Cool. That's pretty cool. I gotta give him credit for that. He's like, cool. oh, I'm making a Western. I can't put a car yeah. in. I'll find a way, damn it. That's pretty cool. I gotta give, I gotta give him credit for yeah, that. That's yeah. pretty cool. I love Sam Raimi. So. Uh, the same year, though, yeah. there was also the other film he came out mm -hmm. with. Virtuosity. Yes. From director Brett Leonard, which mm -hmm. I thought was cool because he's the guy who did Lawnmower Man, which is a great, fun film. Yep. Um, it's interesting to think about Virtuosity because... Uh, in the same year that you have Russell Crowe's hero, mm -hmm. he's the villain. Yes. I mean, this is the Denzel Washington sort of future cop mm -hmm. movie yeah. where he plays the villain opposite yeah. him. I think it's interesting also to note that this movie is... I mean, this is one of those movies that 
when you're actually watching it, or if you, or I should say, if you sit down and look at at what happens afterwards, the plot is it's got a lot of problems. It's got a lot of holes. It's not great. But Denzel Washington ain't still in his prime. Russell Russell Crowe coming into his American prime are both so good in the film that they carry, even though the plot is kind of crap, these two just main actors just beating their heads against each other. Well, I mean, it's funny because it is bookended then by American Gangster. Yeah. Which has Russell Crowe as the good guy That's and true. Denzel Washington as the bad mm -hmm. guy. You know, and that at that point, both of them were full-on superstars. Yeah. I mean, granted, And that one, it's the other way around, where the plot overdoes how good their acting is. Yeah, and it I, is a mirror. <laughs> and I mean, I mean, we've gone through yeah. my problems with American yes. Gangster, but um, you know, this uh, this is definitely a much less serious film. I mean, yeah, this is I mean, much lighter fare. It's, I mean, Sid sixty seven yeah. six point seven, which yeah. uh, Russell Crowe's playing is supposed to be a computer virtual reality amalgamation of like all the worst serial killers and criminals in history sort that of, cops can test themselves. Sort against. of uh, reminds me of. Uh, Wesley Snipes and Demolition Oh, Man. totally. And it's not even surprising to me in the least bit to hear that this movie is made by the guy who did Lawnmower Man because mm -hmm. it is ripe with the what would technology you get out of hand and be crazy was, I mean, this is a really interesting time in terms of history, in terms of technology. It's true. I mean, this is probably 95. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is right internet. when the internet was be getting popular. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the, the future of technology was very much oh, unknown yeah. at that point. Because so. the idea is that this virtual reality downloads itself into this like semi android nano machine body and is then terrorizing the real world and Denzel Washington the the only cop who could beat him in virtual reality is sent after him uh funny sort of they were in this movie uh -huh. moment uh Kaylee Cuoco yep, film from, debut from uh What's it? Big uh, Bang Theory. Big Bang Theory yep. and Eight Simple Rules. Mm -hmm. This uh, is her film debut. She was in this as well as Tracy Lords. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were there. <laughs> Tracy Lords, she's in everything. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> A lot of things oh. we, don't, we don't talk about on here. Oh, 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 oh. Oh. <laughs> you know, it was it was a lighter fare, but it wasn't until you know a few years later that he really started to garner attention. First, L.A. Confidential, oh, yeah. which was got nominated for an ensemble award mm -hmm. at the Golden Globe or Screen Actors Guild, I think I forget. Um, but then The Insider yes. really brought him as a lead actor to yes. prominence and dramatic actor, not yes. just an uh, action star or any of the various things he had done. And I would, I, I mean, I would say this and uh, L.A. Confidential really yes. sort of turned him from that sort of. Um, unknown actor to hero yes because once you become hero it's very rare that you sort of drift yes, back into the villain very and true. so he was kind of set in this sort of hero mold here and the insider is a story about you know a cigarette insider who decides to essentially whistleblower whistleblower and I, this i think this i was actually thinking about that this was one of the first times i ever had the concept of what a whistleblower mm, was i mean mm -hmm. I, I was still in high school when this came out yeah and this was the first time i think this is sort of right around the time the whole concept of whistleblowing was really starting to blow up probably and um you know you have russell crowe as this whistleblower opposite al pacino yeah. i mean talk about a great guy the opposite talk about taking a guy who seems like he's out of nowhere and putting him into a very high standard when your uh, your acting chops are opposite al pacino before jack and jill had happened yeah. i mean whoo damn I mean, this is this is Michael Mann. This is almost uh -huh. like forgotten Michael Mann. It's funny when you talk about Michael Mann, Michael Mann that you have like you talk about he uh -huh. maybe Public Enemies or Collateral or any oh, number collateral. of ones, Miami Vice, mm -hmm. any of that sort of stuff. But this is actually Manhunter. Oh. Yep, that was right. <laughs> but this is you know classic sort of Michael Mann. It's great, and it was I mean well well received. I yes. mean it was nominated for Best Picture. It was uh, nominated for Best uh, Screenplay, mm -hmm. Best Director. Sadly, you know this was the same year as American Beauty, so American Beauty really slapped that down yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean Kevin Spacey beat Russell Crowe for best actor mm -hmm. um, but you know nevertheless it's a really really solid film and this is really sort of the beginning of Russell Crowe as like uh, a nominated actor because mm -hmm. after this it's almost like every year he got nominated for several yeah. years there it was just it was prolific I also think it's interesting to note considering last was I think last time yes last time when we talked about um or recently, we talked about Thank You for Smoking. Yes. How in Thank You for Smoking, it was a movie about like tobacco lobbyists, mm -hmm. and it was how interesting it was that they kept smoking completely out of sure. the film. Yeah, yeah. In the other end, I think there's a, an interesting note about this movie, which is that the real Jeffrey Wiglin, because it's based on an actual person, mm -hmm. based on a true story, yeah. uh, had two concessions for the filmmaker about this film being made. One was that they changed the name of his daughters. 
because mm, okay. there's a sure. lot of like identity change. Sure. And two, with that there would be no smoking anywhere in the film. He Seems actually didn't want it. There were three small instances where there was smoking, but not in any huge major way. They just was there, but. It makes sense, I mean, oh, given totally. the subject matter of the film. Oh, definitely, but it's an interesting to look yeah. at to see that Thank You for Smoking was probably deliberately done because of an artistic choice, and this was more of a source material sure. choice. It's just interesting to look yeah, at those two totally. things, both dealing with tobacco lobbyists. We're good. Like interesting it. stuff, but such a great movie, and yeah. fat Russell Crowe, which you don't, we don't get to see very often. Now, especially considering the next year, mm -hmm. Gladiator came out. Yes. Routine, you know, Russell Crowe, or sorry, Ridley Scott. Yes. Um, this is the sword and sandals period piece mm -hmm. about a gladiator who's made into a slave who <laughs> rises up from the Colosseum. Yeah, and... whatever, whatever the little like slogan was. Oh yeah, <laughs> gladiator Man be becomes myth or, or yeah. gladiator oh, yeah. becomes a slave oh, or yes. becomes a revolution. Becomes a legend. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, you know this is the classic um, story of. Russell Crowe versus Joaquin Phoenix. This yes. is one of the films that brought Joaquin Phoenix really to prominence oh, yeah. as sort of was it Maximus, oh, yeah. Yeah. the villainous um, emperor yes. in or waiting. Commodus, Commodus, Commodus sorry, Russell yes. Crowe. Sorry, you're right. Uh, Commodus, yes. the villainous emperor in waiting. Oh, the son man, of them. so villainous. Yes. The um, famous thumb down. Well, that's sort of just classic Rome, yeah. too. I mean, he didn't create that. Oh, no, anything, I'm not saying... I'm just saying in the sense of it's become very... Uh, that image has been very iconicalized. Yeah, I remember I remember this being previewed when I was in high school, and I was I was really excited for it, and a lot of people I knew were like, yeah, I don't really know about that. Yeah. And then it came out, and everyone was just like, wow, that was, that was great. Because you got to think, like, probably the most recent big sword and sandals-esque movie that anybody could remember would be, like, Spartacus, or, like, Ben-Hur, like, old in school Hollywood yeah. days. So it had been a while since that had been brought back probably mostly for special effects reasons yeah totally and I, it makes sense considering some of the well, crazy stuff that they did in that they movie. won uh best visual effects so they should go. if not and costumes if well. not for just the following fact that the actor oliver reed who played uh, yes. proximus i think uh <laughs> suffered a fatal heart attack shocking a dude who was a prolific drinker during his life <laughs> a big fat dude who drank a lot died yeah. um during principal photography so not even like wrap up or anything uh, some of the sequence had to be re-edited and a double photographed in the shadows with a 3D CGI mask of That's Reed's crazy. face was used as a stand-in. An estimated cost of $3 million. Wow. And the film is dedicated to his memory. Entertainingly enough, they looked at it and it seems like you think, what's the budget for this movie? $103 million. Yeah, there's that extra three. <laughs> yeah. right? You're like, $100 million. That's crazy. Add $3 million doesn't seem huge. What is crazy to realize is that if they didn't do that, the original idea they had before that, which was reshooting everything mm -hmm. and getting a different actor, and like based on the insurance money, was going to cost twenty-five million, a quarter of the whole budget that's compared crazy. to three percent. Yeah, that's, well, that's a pretty big difference. That's crazy. Pretty big difference. <laughs> and you know, it's, this is one of those really ones that you know, I don't know if I necessarily knew Russell Crowe with The Insider. Like, yeah, I don't know. I think if I saw a cider probably after. Right. But this was really like, okay, Russell Crowe. It's yeah. that dude. Like, yeah. okay, I know you <laughs> yeah. by name because yeah. of this movie. And the action in this film is great. You know, oh, yeah. the story is great. Not surprisingly, won Best Picture. Yeah. Which, you know, not only is this continuing a trend of him being nominated the previous year for Best Picture with The Insider, yes. winning this time, but he also was nominated for Best uh, Actor in a Lead Role. Wow. And, amusingly enough, lost to Denzel Washington for Training Day. Ha! <laughs> Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Those two have got a rivalry going on. And and, and you know, I, I brought up the Mel Gibson connection mostly because Mel Gibson turned down. Oh, this sorry, role. sorry, sorry. No, he won lead actor oh, for okay. this one. Sorry, I was looking okay. at the year after this. Okay. Yeah. No, he won lead actor for this. Um, yeah, it was nominated for like a dozen hmm. awards essentially. This is this was the film of the year. Yes. So it yes. was it was dominant. But you, you see this sort of ascending trend uh -huh. in his career, you know, best picture nominated uh -huh. be, or nominated best picture nominated best actor. Win best picture, win uh -huh. best actor, and just keeps going up yep. there for a few years. Sort of like Tom Hanks in the early nineties oh, in definitely. Philadelphia, Forrest Gump and then Apollo thirteen yeah. all in sort of a row. Just a crazy triplicate there. And I don't know if you, I mean, somebody out there can tell us this, the numbers, probably, but the following year, then, he has A Beautiful Mind, oh, yeah. which also won Best Picture, and, mm -hmm. and he was also nominated for Best Actor, lost to Denzel for this one, but <laughs> I don't know how many actors have been nominated for Best Picture, Best Actor, three years in a row, in a row. <laughs> and not only that, but won Best Picture two of those times. Wow. 
So, I mean, that's pretty Damn. prolific. Yeah. No wonder the dude just picks his own rules yeah. now and gets huge paychecks. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> and so, Beautiful Mind is the story of John Nash, mm-hmm. the uh, brilliant mathematician who also has schizophrenia. Schizophrenia, yes. Um, and it was funny. I remember seeing the trailer for this movie. Seeing the trailer for this movie and calling that Jennifer Conway was going to win Best Supporting Actress for a role <laughs> as his wife. Literally, like, I was like, I bet she wins Best Supporting Actor for her. I hadn't seen it, like, the film itself. Totally deserved. Three months. Yeah, she was great. Like, and it, it, the story, you know, in terms, if you look at sort of, like, the rest of the Best Picture nominees, like, um, which at the time, this was against Gosford Park, Fellowship of the Ring, In the Bedroom, and Moulin Rouge. I kind of feel like it was a little bit of a down year. I mean, maybe you could argue In the Bedroom, though I didn't particularly love that movie. Um, I don't think A Beautiful Mind was probably a bad pick out of those. I don't think it was, but I don't think it's like nearly as strong of a movie as, say... I, I mean, I think perhaps maybe The Insider would yeah. be a more deserving Best Picture film. I would agree. Uh, between the two, definitely. Between the, I yeah. mean, I thought A Beautiful Mind was a decent movie. I oh, enjoyed yeah. it. But there was a lot of like, yeah, that was good. Like, yeah, it, it, it didn't feel as cohesive, perhaps, as some of his other projects. It's strange to think how little lasting power that movie has. Because mm-hmm. I always... I owned this movie at a point in time, and I still forget it exists till I look it up. Which, it, I mean, just blows my mind, kind of, that it can manage yeah. to slip in and out. Totally, no, no. You know? And maybe it was just one of those things that came out, and it was so touching and moving, and it won all these awards, so then nobody had to think about it anymore in retrospect. Well, I, th- I think, you know, I feel like it, part of it was that it felt like this was really, I think, the peak of the Ron Howard Oscar bait discussion. Uh. And it definitely feels like that. I mean, he won Best Director for it. Okay. Um, so, you know, there's that to be said. It mm-hmm. won Best Picture, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, this is also sort of the peak of the Russell Crowe power. I mean, this mm-hmm. is his last Oscar nomination. Hmm. Hasn't gotten an Oscar nomination since then. And he sort of tapered off a little bit after that. He, he got Golden Globe nominations for Master and Commander and Cinderella Man. Okay. But basically tapered that's his last huh. Golden Globe nominations too. So like huh. he's really sort of left the major um American consciousness as well. I mean he's still a major actor, but mm-hmm. he's not nearly what he was yeah. at this point in his career. It's also I, I don't know, I think it's kinda interesting that there was a lot of thing whenever you're taking like someone's life story mm. and making a film out of it, I think you walk a really fine line with like kind of washing over details mm. to make something look good in retrospect uh, or I think I know where you're heading with or this. just going so in detail that it kind of loses its original focus which I, th- I think is part of the reason that this got uh, some flack was yes. because John Nash is a bigot he's a race is it he not? is a few things he's, but he, me, he's, <laughs> a, he's an anti-semite yes right. so that's amongst the big many one. other things let's see so there were elements of his life that were deliberately omitted from the film like not just we don't think but like full-on nope uh he was married twice both to the same woman mm. lisa nash uh, in the past he had several affairs with both men and women hmm. he was arrested by police for by the police for scandal he fathered an out of child uh, a child out, a child out of wedlock in his 20s. He believed that his mental illness was from extraterrestrials who spoke to him, giving him Seems advanced fair. knowledge by means of cosmic connection with Seems them. Seems plausible. He tried to renounce his American nationality a number of times in the belief that the U.S. government pursued him, and he made numerous Did anti-Semitic... You know that sort of reminds me of? Bobby Fischer. Ah, uh, yes. Anti-Semite who mm-hmm. renounced his American... Made system. numerous anti-Semitic comments during his period of extreme mental illness, most of which he equated... Jews with communism. He was also, interestingly enough, uh, homosexual, but they purposely left that one out as well because they didn't want homosexual to be in some way connected with a reason for his schizophrenia, which is actually a good decision. That's a good decision, but at the same time, this is the early 2000s. I mean, homosexuality was still in the process of becoming more yes. widely accepted. I'm sure they just don't, they, they wanted to make him as sympathetic as possible. Yeah. And just like a lot of those things are, you know, some of those things are like people have faults, but that's a lot of like dings for a character well, personality when you're trying to make it sympathetic. I, I think that was the whole thing was that when this was like nominated for best picture, that it slipped out that he was an anti-Semite. Yes. And there was like this whole, like, is, are they, is somebody trying to do a campaign to sort yes. of undercut the uh-huh. movie? And, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's got a lot of flaws and, you know, and it's, I think maybe that's why I didn't have last, power maybe a lot of that stuff came eh, out afterwards and people were a little I, bit more I would hesitant. argue that it's just like it's not as great of a film as like it's beloved like it won yes. best picture but 
you know, it's not as great a best picture yes. as some of the other ones, perhaps. It's true. It's, it's just, true. it was sort of a lighter year that yes. it won, and that helped so it out. Sometimes that happens, that you yeah. can have things like Pulp Fiction not get it, because they're going against other greats, but yeah. then you can have Beautiful Mind win against... Some and I mean, not to, not to disparage and say it's a bad film. It's still no, yeah. a decent film, but it's not. Is it best picture? Is it The Insider? No. But like, <laughs> would it, would it win against stauncher competition? I don't think so. I don't think it would. Yeah. So, let's move right along. Mm -hmm. Another one, probably. I guess this is um, one of his last sort of nominated <laughs> roles. Yeah. Again, another period piece. Mm -hmm. I mean, you did. I guess technically, The Insider. Um, yeah. L.A. Confidential, Gladiator, mm -hmm. you do Quick American Gangster, Quick and the Dead, mm -hmm. um, Master and Commander, yes. Far Side of the World. This was going to be like his franchise. Yes, like this is based on a series of books. Yeah, uh, a pretty popular one, from what I understand. Yeah. in fact, I believe it's two novels: one named Master and Commander, and the other named The Far Side of the World, yes. which is why they tossed him. The, yes, the... but it was it was going to be like you know the big sort of. Action -y yeah, type franchise new, of him. The Horatio Hornblower esque, like, yeah. sea voyage movies. <laughs> He's going to transition from sword and sandals into sword, ships and cannons. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and I mean, you know, it. It really, it, I mean, it's funny to think about. It. You talk about a beautiful mind mm -hmm. being sort of a forgotten mm -hmm. classic. I would say Master and Commander is even more so. Oh, definitely. And you think about it, it, it was not made for probably. Even if not more wow. Academy Awards than A Beautiful Mind. Wow. Granted, it didn't win mm -hmm. any of them, really. Or it won sound and cinematography, which had good cinematography, I'll give it oh, that. Yeah. But it was nominated for Best Picture and Best Director. Hmm. No, um, Note, though, this was the same year as Lord of the Rings, Return of the King. Yes. So that just, like, Had destroyed to, yeah. everything else coming they out the year. They done nothing for the first two films. They tossed everything yes. in the third one. But I also want to note... Russell Crowe, not nominated for acting. Interesting. At least Academy Awards. He was nominated huh. for Golden Globe. Huh. But let me tell you who was nominated. Um, Johnny Depp, Pirates of the Caribbean. I think there could only be one swashbuckling yep. type movie. Yep. And this I is think, the same year. Went big and big and boisterous rather than accurate. Yeah. But this is also, I mean, he didn't win. Sean yeah. Penn won for Mystic River this year. Uh, this yes, was that right. year where Mystic River took like the acting awards mm -hmm. and Lord of the Rings took, took like everything, everything else. else. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, thinking back about it, like I'd be hard pressed to really say anything of Russell Crowe's performance that stood out to me. Yeah. Like he was fine. He does. Staunch captain. He, do, he does period piece as well. Mm -hmm. He does heroes well. But if you ask me like to rank his heroes, I don't. This wouldn't be top five, no. and I'm not even sure it would be top ten. Honestly. However, it would definitely pro be top five in my list of Russell Crowe movies. I would probably really. Put it You're right a big up fan there. of it. I, it's a it's such a great film for it's a it's a I think it's a genre or a setting. I don't know what they want to use the word, with the exception of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies recently. Mm. That's really either been hard to do or failed or lost because it was in the epic scale of sets yeah. in the olden days totally. they kind of went that way and then cutthroat island happened and nobody wanted to touch ships for yeah. as long as possible i was a big fan of white squall if you remember that one i do not about the i think it was a like uh one of the bridges i think maybe jeff bridges lloyd bridges i forget which one i think well, jeff. I an actual bridge um, actual. scott wolf no no it's about a <laughs> ship that like of like youngsters sort of like okay. that, that gets turned over Ooh. and a bunch of them die because hmm. of it sort of like a school slash ship type thing it, hmm. i enjoyed it it was huh. fun um yeah you know i think this film just really the story never really felt that um sort of in the dramatic -y realm okay. like it never really felt like they're saying. that in danger like okay. there are moments where like stuff was going sideways mm. but a lot of it's just like them doing educational stuff sort of like charles darwin -ish mm. type mm -hmm. stuff or just crazy long ship fights yeah. in fog which are <laughs> and i was like you know, i was like yeah i mean some people are dying but i don't really feel as quite hmm. dr as much danger as i felt like i needed for I can, a film I can like this that. i my dad's my dad went is a navy person and grew up in the bay area and is always on a boat my dad so grew up in the bay area as well it's just something about i don't know like i, I maybe have a, like a soft spot inside mm. for like 
crazy old school Navy films and uh, just, yeah, maybe you know anything from Crimson Tide to, to Master and Commander. And you know it's interesting they did a lot of I mean this film had a lot of really accurate period pieces. They got like a mm. they got a watch company to make time pieces that were accurate wow, to the time. That's cool. They had over 2000 costumes that they used. Um 27 miles of rope were used That's in the rigging of, of the replica Rose, because there's the two major ships mm -hmm. in the film, which one is a replica of an actual ship that existed, and I think the other one is like a replica an older one that's brought back and mm -hmm. retrofit or something. Sure. One of them they bought for like one and a half million dollars, like actually bought the, the ship with the condition that they would give it back to the historical society when they were mm. done shooting the film. But um, these 27 miles of rope on one ship because the rope had to be made specifically because modern day rope has a right hand lay. So the strand run, wow. when in Napoleonic times they had a left hand lay. So they literally had to That's buy 20, to 27 miles of custom rope. That's attention to detail <laughs> yeah. right there. That's cool. Yeah, they did a lot of things like that. Like co everybody had um, color coded costumes that gave them that showed their rank, and so everyone stayed in that when they were on the ship, so that they kind of kept sequestered and everybody kind of kept that crew mentality. It was another one of those things where like everybody really got into the role. They stayed on the ship. They didn't have technology. That that's kind of cool. Thing. So I dig it. Attention to detail. I really like this. But any you know, on a period piece, that's like half the battles. Attention sure. to detail. <laughs> okay, right. I get that. Uh, brings us to this Friday, though, uh, November 2nd. Yeah, oh, well, look at that. Man with the Iron Fist. Mm -hmm. This is the film directed by the RZA, co-written by him, and co-written slash produced by Eli Roth. Yes. This is the Eli Roth Presents, or I yes. guess Quinn Tarantino Presents. Yeah. They're Eli both Roth involved. and both Quinn Tarantino both shoved money at the movie. Yes. Then, so. This is the story of a... Um, sort of humble blacksmith who has to defend himself and his fellow villagers from a series a band of warriors assassins and rogue soldiers classic uh kung fu chopsaki martial arts film well, that was the thing that, like the thing the first thing <laughs> that popped in my mind when i, I heard hip-hop kung fu i was like ghost dog like that mm. was the first thing that popped in my mind and i thought samurai shampoo which is a cartoon which you yeah which you did music i think for think for obviously this is not set in the same time as Ghost Dog. This is yes. so that's not really necessarily <laughs> a direct comparison. But you know, obviously the Rizza has a lot of love for Kung Fu. Yes. He's a very talented um musician. Mm -hmm. I mean yeah. Wu Tang clan. Yeah. Ain't nothing to fuck with. That's true. Like, let's Did all the music for Ghost Dog? Did mu music for Kill Bill? Yep. Uh, and he's done some acting too. I yeah. mean, a lot of yeah. people forget about that, but he was in the box. He was in Funny People. He's an American gangster. Yeah. Yeah. He was uh, in Coffee and Cigarettes, the Jim Jarmusch film. Yes. So like, he's he is a talented a little guy. Cameo on Ghost Dog too. Yep. Like he is a talented guy. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people forget that. Strangely enough, he is the hero in this movie. Mm -hmm. He is the blacksmith. So it, it, Wu Tang. He and Wu Tang have been trying to get into kung fu movies for so long. Yeah. Like voices and animes and like music no, for totally. stuff. And I'm surprised that Method Man. In this I'm just surprised it actually took this long. Yeah. But I think it's interesting to have you have Riza as a main character, you have Lucy Liu as a villain, I think. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure, I assume villain, but I'm not sure Russell Crowe's. I, I'm pretty stance. sure I'm pretty sure everyone but, but the Riza is, the, is yeah. As so villainous. you got Russell Crowe, you got Lucy Liu, you got Jamie Chung. Oh, that's right, yeah. Um who's in Eden, mm -hmm. which is local film that's mm -hmm. done done well. You have Pam Greer in there as well. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you got all sorts of good people. David ba Dave uh, David Bautista, I believe, MMA fighter. Okay, yeah. Um, he's in it as well, I mean. And the trailer just is so packed with yeah. blood and gore. It yeah. looks like it's going to be delightful. <laughs> I mean, it's it's definitely a lower budget film. It's only $20 million to make this. So. It's low budget nowadays? Yeah, it's pretty God. low budget. I mean, you think about it. I'll take $20 million to make a low budget film. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you think back a few years ago, twenty million dollars probably be close to Russell Crowe's fee for a movie, honestly. Like, yeah. so, um, you, but know, you I, know what? In the '90s, the cast of Friends was still making a million dollar each an episode. Per episode yeah. So think about true. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's true. It's true. I don't know. I think both of us are looking forward. I wouldn't say it's like my top five most no. looking forward to films, but you know, I think it will probably be fun. I think it will be a get up on a Sunday morning. Drink a bunch of mimosas, wander to the theater that has the cheap matinees, and I, enjoy I call myself. it like a one and done. Like I'll see it uh, once and I'll yeah. probably be good. Yeah. I don't know if I'll never. Yeah. See, it'll see be it on again. Netflix instant two years from now, and you'll put it on the background. Yeah, I'll be like, yeah, yeah that, was, that was good. That was, but that was it, fun. it just looks pretty violent, yeah. and I'm I'm okay with violent. And I'm curious to see what the Rizzo does as a director. I'm curious. Yeah, I'm interested to see what random role Russell Crowe has as like a gunslinger esque type character in a martial arts yeah. film. Jackknife. 
Is that his name? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Anyway, uh, join us next week mm-hmm. for our DVD rundown for the week of uh, uh, November 6th. Yeah. We're already in November. Super Tuesday. Ah, ah. Vote. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Vote. Vote and watch the we'll MacGuffin. We'll tell you again next week. Vote. We're watching the MacGuffin. Vote for the MacGuffin. Yeah. Wait. You can vote write for Write it in. Yeah, write Presidential it in. Presidential yeah. Covenant, Obama, Spencer Romney, Greg. other MacGuffin podcast. Yeah. I take it. And as always, you know, you can find us at MacGuffinPodcast.com, Twitter.com slash MacGuffinCast, Facebook.com slash MacGuffinPodcast, phone number 323-761-9842. We're on iTunes, Blip, Roku, Miro. Check in and get glue. And we will see you next time. Stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Magneto can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. This tech don't even try to buy the size of stars. Mr. Spock can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Rath of Khan can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The board can't stop